Sunday night, we are in a study on the book of Revelation. We've been in this book for, I don't know, 220, 225 weeks on Sunday night. We've gone through the, we've gone through all of the, most of the verses in the book. We find that the first chapter is like a glossary to the book. It tells you what the rest of the book means. The second and third chapter is about the seven churches of Asia. And uh, it's not just merely seven churches. There's only one church. And there were more than seven churches in Asia. Asia, what we call Asia, is not the Asia of the Bible. The Asia of the Bible was Asia Minor. And that was the western end of what we call Turkey. That was Asia Minor. And John was on the Isle of Patmos writing to the seven churches. But there were more than seven churches in Asia. Therefore, uh, this is not in, simply talking about seven churches because those letters were given for our edification. What? No, fix my shirt. Okay. That's the best thing to say. Okay. Now, the second and third chapter, and of course, the seven churches, when you look at the last verse of the first chapter, Jesus has seven stars in his right hand in verse 16, and then in verse 20. We, and of course, we see Jesus standing amidst the seven candlesticks, and seven candlesticks is Jewish. So is seven stars, for that matter. The seven stars was the Pleiades. The Pleiades uh, supposedly is the seven stars in the left shoulder of Taurus, or in the constellation Taurus. Now, I'm going to be teaching on the gospel in the stars and how Christ is written in the stars uh, on Sunday morning and Wednesday night here very shortly. But the Pleiades was called the morning star, and it, that was the seven stars, seven stars, and when Amos, Amos, the fifth chapter, the Lord says, Seek him, seek him that makes the seven stars and Orion. Now, why would we seek him that makes the seven stars or the Pleiades and Orion? That's because Pleiades was the morning star, and the morning star came out in the spring, and the rabbi said that the morning star drew the sap up in the vine and brought crops to Israel. So when you see the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, this is figurative language with a referral back to the seven stars of the Old Testament. And when the Lord tells Job, can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades and loose the bands of Orion, Job? Well, the Orion was the evening star in the winter, and the rabbi said that the evening star had great cold and that the evening star drew the sap down into the vine. But if you loose the bands of Orion, what you do in the winter, you allow the sap to come up like God does. You, you bring a warm front in, like in the middle of January, and the sap comes up and the crocuses start blooming and some of the grass begins to come up and then God hits with a freeze and he kills the fruit trees, and he kills all the crop that's going to come up in the spring. So whenever you see the seven stars, it has dual meanings. And you, you come up with uh, the Pleiades when he says, can you bind the sweet influences? The sweet influences of Pleiades are the seven stars. Of course, remember, remember the morning star spiritually is Christ, isn't it? Christ. Well, if, if you get crops... And it's not to say that crops actually came up by the Pleiades, but that's what the rabbis said. So God uses their culture or their custom to say, uh, Pleiades brings you crops. Well, what is it? Or brings fruit in the spring. So whenever you have the morning star or the seven stars, when you see the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, and that is Christ, when you see the seven stars, then that is alluding back to the Pleiades of the Old Testament that brought up crops. So what kind of crops or fruit do we get 
when we have the seven stars. What do we get? We get spiritual fruit. We get the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit of Spirit. And that's just another mathematical, uh, miraculous picture, the way God paints His Word. And, and uh, we've had, last year, we had, we had a loosing of the bands of Orion because we had, a, during January, we had a, a warm front come in and then God popped us with a freeze and it killed a lot of, a lot of the shrubs and a lot of the trees last year. That's, but God says, I can do that and destroy everything. So when you see the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, it all has, all of it equates together, whether it's the Pleiades over here, whether it's the morning star over here, or the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, or whether it is Christ, the morning star. It equates together. And when you look at verse 20, probably the most, one of the most important verses in all of the book of Revelation is verse 20 of chapter 1. And that's because this explains the rest of the book more than anything else. He says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and right hand was always the hand of authority, and the seven golden candlesticks. He said, here's the mystery, the Mysterion. Now, if he's going to reveal to you the mystery, reveal, the word reveal, revelation comes from the word reveal. Revelation is apocalypsis. And reveal is the word apocalypto. And he says, I'm fixing to show you the mystery, Mysterion, Muo means to shut the mouth or keep the mouth shut. We get the word mute from that. It means to keep your mouth shut. But he says, I'm going to reveal to you the mystery. And the greatest revelation in the book of Revelation is verse 20 of chapter 1. Here's the mystery of the seven stars and of the seven candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. If they're the angels, if the seven stars are the angels, seven stars are seven angels. Are angels, there's seven of them, aren't they? They're the seven angels. Well, that's really going to clear up a lot when you get to Revelation 8, 9, and 10 because you've got seven angels with seven trumpets, don't you? Huh? Got seven angels with seven trumpets. An angel is the word A-G-G-E-L-O-S. And that word angelos is the word messenger. It's just a common Greek word, messenger. If you, if under Greek culture, if you take a message uh, to your next door neighbor, if you tell your kid, take this message over there to Susie next door and that we need to borrow some sugar, then that child is, is, would be considered under Jewish culture an angel, a messenger. That's all it means. That's all it means. And you got seven trumpets with seven angels. But the seven angels, it's not seven messengers because it goes on to say that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. But it's not seven candlesticks. It's one lamp, isn't it? One lamp. That's all it is. And the message is inside the lamp. It's the oil inside the lamp. That's the Holy Spirit. I keep saying that seven means to complete or refine. Sheba is the word seven. Shaba comes from the exact same root as seven. This is the word seven. And Shaba means to take an oath to God or to complete or to seven ones Self. Now, if you've been here, you understand that the sevening of oneself has to do with going through fiery trials. That is a blood baptism. That's what it is. God baptizes us in fire, puts us through fiery trials, and he sevens us and completes us and makes us mature. So whenever you see the seven angels are the, the seven stars are the seven angels, the seven stars are the refined message of God inside the refined church. The seven candlesticks is the refined church. 
So what this is talking about is the mature message of God. Then when you get over to Revelation, the 7th and 8th, uh, 8, excuse me, 8, 9, and 10th chapter, 8, 9, and 10, you see seven angels with seven trumpets, seven trumpets, and when the last of these seven trumpets sounds, when the last one sounds in Revelation 10 and 7, the mystery of God is over. It's finished. And the mystery of God is the church. And we're going to be changed at the last trump. And that's why there's no pre-trib rapture. We're changed at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15, 51, and 52. And I'm going to go back to this later. But this, you have to, to see Revelation. We went through 2 and 3. And then you get into 4 and 5. And you get into the heavens, which was Israel. And you get into uh, the tabernacle or the temple. I'm not going to go through that right now. You get into the 24 elders, which are the 24 sons of Aaron's two sons, Ithamar and Eliezer, and you get into so much more. But what we've done, we've gone through the, we've gone through the, uh, the fourth and fifth chapter. We've gone through the sixth chapter, the first four seals, which is the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast. And we've gone through chapter 7 about the sealing of the servants of God. And 8, 9, and 10 are the seven trumpets. And you also have the two witnesses over in chapter 11. And the two, it takes two witnesses to verify anything in a Jewish court of law. And we went on through chapter 12, which is the casting out of Satan in the earth, uh, where Michael cast him out of heaven. And then he uh, persecutes the church. This is the dragon persecuting the church and uh, then we got to Revelation 13 we went through that went through 14 the 144,000 which is the first fruits that's the church and we went through 15 uh, beginning the vows the study of the vows in 16 Armageddon and 17 is the de- is the definition of the harlot of Babylon and uh, we're tying together 13 and 17 And when you get to, and I'm just kind of reviewing a little bit for people that hadn't been here. When you get, people need to understand something about Revelation. Revelation is not a sequence of events. Uh, It doesn't mean that chapter 4 sequentially follows chapter 3. It doesn't mean that. Because When you get to Revelation 6 and in Revelation 8, you have the end of time in all of these chapters. Revelation 11, Revelation 14, Revelation 16, Revelation 18, Revelation 19, All of these chapters show the end of time. What they are, they're just simply different views. You look, John, the angel comes to John, takes him up, and he sees a vision from this direction. And then another chapter, he's showing him a vision of some of the same time factors from this direction. So that's what these are talking about. And some of this is not merely about the end of time. Some of it is about from the time of John in AD 70, in 96 AD when he wrote this all the way to the end of time. Revelation is not just about the end of time. And when you get, and what we're doing, when you get to Revelation 16, Revelation 16, uh, 16, Revelation 16, you have a parenthesis between Revelation 16 and Revelation 19. 17 and 18 is a parenthesis in the sense that 17 introduces the harlot. harlot, Well, it doesn't introduce her there, but it, it brings out who she is, that she is the Babylonian system of religion. And then 18... Uh, shows you the destruction of this system. 
Shows you the destruction and what it is. 16 is the end of time. That's Armageddon. And then you can skip. You can actually read 16 and go directly to 19. 17 and 18 have to be studied. You can just pull that out, exegete that out, and study it separately. Because chapter 19 is where Christ comes back uh, on a great white horse, eyes as a flame of fire. And Armageddon is right here. The events of 16 and 19 are basically the same events from a different viewpoint. Now, we've gone through all this. Now, let's get back to the beast. Now, the beast has got everybody scared. Everybody's worrying about whether they're going to have to take the mark of the beast. If we take the mark, uh, what if somebody forces me to take the mark? I don't want to take it. Then I have to go to hell. Well, that ain't the way it is. The mark of the beast was in the garden. And I'm not going to go back through that. I've done a whole lot on that. We went through so much of that. I'll just say this. The word mark is the word karagma. C-H-A-R-A-G-M-A. Karagma. It means an etching. An etching or something engraved. Of course, what that is, when the Lord says in, in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, he said, take my law. And put it where you lie down, where you rise up. Put it by your bed. Put it where you walk. Put it before your eyes. Put it on your hand. Put it on your t-shirt. <laughs> I thought I'd put that in. <laughs> That's what I do. I write all kinds of stuff on my t-shirts. And uh, he says, put it before your eyes. He didn't mean put a phylactery, a little black box there. It's not what he meant. And that's what the Jews thought he meant. Put it on your hand. Well, he didn't mean put a black box, call it a phylactery, and put these verses in it so you can be protected by the Word of God like, as a, like a talisman of some kind. Yeah, that's not what he's talking about. Before the eyes meant to put in the mind, on the hand, but where you raised your hand, the work you did for God, put it there. Raising up holy hands, you can't raise up holy hands, raise them up in the air. That's not raising holy hands to God. The Bible says God... In Acts, the 17th chapter, God is not worshipped with men's hands. You can't worship God with these fleshly hands. Holy hands means from the heart to do the work of God. When you go out, besides that, if you want to look at that, it's really funny to me. It's, it's funny when you go over there to 1 Timothy. You go to 1 Timothy. This is really kind of... Hilarious. Uh, he says, I will therefore that men, verse 8, chapter 2 of 1 Timothy, just, we're talking about putting the God's law upon your hand. He doesn't mean, and he doesn't mean raise your hands in the air. See, this is just another confusion of holy hands. Holy hands means to write God's law on your hand, but it comes from your heart. It doesn't mean it's a literal writing on your hand. You'll either take God's mark on your hand or in your forehead, or you'll take the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast was all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's about buying and selling. That was what was in the tree. And he says here, and I always like to show this to people, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands, hagios hands, H-A-G-I-O-S, how in the world can your flesh be hagios or pure? Huh? It can't be. But what's so funny, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Now that's comical to me because wrath is the word orge. And orge is feminine gender and that's the wrath, that's the wrath of revenge or covetousness taking revenge on somebody for getting your doing you in. So if it meant to raise your hands in the air without trying to take revenge on somebody, God is saying, raise your hands up in the air without getting mad at your brother and say, I'll get you for that. Praise God, I'll get you, you know. You understand what I'm saying? And without wrath and doubting, and that word is the word dia, logismos, D-I-A, 
L-O-G-I-S-M-O-S. And dialogismos means without disputing. Well, if it meant to raise your hands in the air, God says, now don't argue with the guy next to you while you're raising your hands in the air. And don't get mad at him while you're raising the hands in the air. Like God had some kind of, like Paul had some kind of problem. Uh, Timothy had some kind of problem when he's passing a church over there, people raising their hands in the air, getting mad at each other and saying, I'm going to get you back. You understand how ridiculous that what I'm trying to say? It's ridiculous. They even forget the without wrath and doubting. What it means, it means put God's mark on your hand from the heart. The mark of the beast is not a computer chip. It's the same thing as the mark of God. The mark of God is God's law. The mark of the beast is the mark of Satan or his laws. And what's Satan's laws? Fulfill the flesh. God wants you to have what you want. God doesn't mean what he says. You can believe in God. And the mark of the beast was in the garden. All that's in the world. All in the world. Lust of the flesh. Lust of the eye. Pride of life. That's what Eve saw in the tree. It was good for food. Fulfill the lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eye. It would fulfill the lust of the eye. It would make her wise. She could be proud. That is what Eve saw in the tree. And she had to go beyond the boundary of God. God's got a boundary, the horizo. Prohorizo is the word predestinate. Horizo means the boundary of light. God said you can eat of all these trees, but do not trespass my mark and go to the mark of the beast. The serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field. So when they went beyond the mark, they went beyond the... Karagma comes from the word karax, which means a stake on a boundary line. They crossed the boundary here and went after... Doesn't it take money to get a hold of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life? It takes money, doesn't it? The love of money is the root of all... The love of money is the root of all evil. That's the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is going after the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not a computer chip. You've either got the mark of God in your forehead and up on your hand... Or you've got the mark of the beast in your heart and you're going after self and the flesh. Now, we've all had that in us. But I keep saying, there's two men and there's Christ in you. And that's the inner man and there's the outer man, which is self. And we got self and we got covetousness and we got pride and we got arrogance. And we got gossiping and we got busybody and we got envy and we got all these things. And over the years, he's got to get rid of that in us and burn it out. That's, that's what men go after when they go after the mark of the beast. They go after the flesh. There's only two laws in the Bible. One is fulfill the flesh and the other is crucify the flesh. That's all. There's not crucify the flesh and fulfill the flesh and then you've got this other thing that's a beast and he's going to rise up and he's going and he's going to be breathing fire and, and he's going to say, you've got to take that mark in your hand. That's really dumb. That's dumb doctrine. Because... Correct. And when you have an engraving, you have it on your hand, and it has the same meaning because that carox is a stake. When you leave the mark of God, God's mark is his food, his it's his etching in our heads and in our foreheads, is it? Isn't it? In our forehead and our hands. That's his etching. And when they would etch, they would mark people. They would mark slaves in their forehead so they could know who they belonged to. That's whose law they observed. But before your head, put it on your head, that meant in your mind. That's what it meant. So when we're talking, and everybody's so interested in the mark of the beast. Oh, is it a computer chip? Computer chips are outdated. Don't you know that? We got something more definite than computer chips called DNA. I mean, why do they have a computer chip when they got your DNA? They can just record everybody's DNA and then they can go in there. It's, but that's not what it is. It's going after the flesh and sin. That is, you know what the mark of the beast is? Sin. That's all it is. 
well, <laughs> sin is the word H A M A R T I A. That's the Greek word sin. It means to miss the mark. It means to miss the mark of God. That's what it means. So, don't worry about whether you get to have to take a computer chip in your hand. That don't mean nothing with God. If somebody comes around and says, you're going to have to take this computer chip. Okay. Because that's not the mark of the beast. Now, now we're talking about the beast. And the power of the beast. The power of the beast. We're talking about the seven heads and ten horns. All right. Now. Who the beast is. We've already gone through it. The beast. You got two beasts. One, two. You got the first beast of Revelation 13. And that beast, that beast is an it. It's not a him. Even though it says him in the original, in the Greek, in the English text. It's it, not him. Because it's a wrong translation. Uh, the word him is A-U-T-O-U. And that has to meet, that has to have the same, the same Gender as the uh, the noun that it's referring back to, which is the antecedent, and the noun is the beast, totherion, and that is neuter gender. So it's 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 an it, not a him. So anytime I read it, I read it. Then you have the second beast that's like a dragon, or like a Dracula. Dracula means dragon. Did you know that? It means dragon. So, it's like a dragon. What did Dracula do? Come to me. Come to me, my dear. I am the count. One, two. I love to count. <laughs> I love the count on uh, Sesame Street. Uh, <laughs> the count fascinates, didn't he? Huh? Didn't he hypnotize people, mesmerize them? Isn't this amazing? All this stuff blends together and convolutes together. And he was a blood drinker, wasn't he? Blood. Of course, of course, the vampire was called a demon in the ancient world. If you believe in demons, you have to believe in vampires. Of course, if you believe in demons, you've got to believe in genies because genies and, and vampires and demons were the same thing and fairies and guardian angels and patron saints and totems. They're all the same thing. If you believe in one, you have to believe in the other because a dragon or a Dracula was a blood... Wait a minute. The beast. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. What did the beast develop into eventually? Roman Catholicism. Wait a minute. I think they drink blood, don't they? Notice the convolution there. Notice the convolution. Except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Do you think this hasn't been... Arranged that way? Sure it has. Sure it has. God arranged it that way. Of course, eat flesh and drink blood does not mean to eat literal flesh and drink literal blood. Jesus said, my flesh is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed. And the word indeed is A-L-E-T-H-E-S. It means of truth. When you eat and drink of truth and you tell people the truth about Christmas is pagan, tell them Christmas, vampires and Christmas go together. Isn't that funny? Vampires and Christmas and the KKK go together and the Masons. They all come out of the same thing. Dracula, vampires, the Masons, the clan. They're all brothers. Of course, the priests of Baal ate human flesh from their altars. Priests, Kahan, Baal, and they shortened it to C-A-H-A-N-A, -A -A, Kanabal, and later on to Cannibal. A devour of human flesh, and this is the fire worship of Israel and the tree worship, and that's the priests of Baal 
And they wore tall white pointed hats white, and wore white sheets and worshipped a flaming cross on Lady Day in the ancient world. Yes, the clan and Dracula come out of the same thing. And that's Christ's mass. And the Masons get all of their secrets out of that. And, I, and you can look here in, a, in my Morals and Dogma and read all about the Christ Mass and Osiris and Lady Day and, and uh, Mother Night, Christmas Eve, Mother Night, the birthday of Mithra, December the 25th, all out of the Masonic book. Isn't that amazing? So, so they're blood drinkers. And that's the Roman Catholicism. So Dracula, the dragon or the blood drinkers, let's put it that way. The blood drinkers gave the beast its power, its seat, and its great authority. Notice the convolution everywhere. Just, just going together. Isn't that something? And go back over here to Revelation 13. Well, let me read one other thing and then I'll go back there. Just read it to you. Out of Acts, the 17th chapter, I'm kind of pitching a bunch of things around. Acts 17, Acts 17, verse 24. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands. Man cannot build something, raise them in the air, or do anything to serve God. It has to be a work that comes from the heart. It has to be Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's God that works in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. Neither is worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything. Seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things. God doesn't need our hands. But He's going to use the hands of the elect to lift them up to the work of God. I love this. Isn't that great? Yeah. Yep. Well, they're blood drinkers, and uh, and they weren't eating crackers and drinking grape juice, and they weren't eating literal flesh and drinking literal blood. They were eating the Passover when Jesus used those words, and it's amazing, isn't it? Now let's go back over here to Revelation, the seventeenth chapter. Well, let me on the way. Let's stop at Revelation thirteen. On the way, Revelation 13, you're just going to read the first two verses. We're talking about the seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Goodness sake, boy, that is sure sounds mysterious if you didn't know. If those of us here didn't know that the beast was Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and they rose up out of the Mediterranean Sea area because it was all the land that surrounded the Mediterranean Sea, Turkey, and over here in Syria, and, and uh, Babylon, and Persia, uh, what we call Iran, what we call Iraq. And out of this system came the beast world system up out of the sea. But it convoluted, and finally, it became... The Roman Catholic system. But everybody's not going to become Roman Catholics and follow them. What everybody's going to do. When people say, "If I thought there's going to be a worldwide religion and a worldwide belief. Well, there already is. You're not going to get the Muslims to become Catholics. And the Baptists to become Muslims. You're not going to do that. What is going to happen, they're going to come up with an attitude of... Let's all hold hands and get along and put up with each other. Oh, wait a minute, I think they did that. They called it the Edict of Toleration when Constantine, Constantine started Roman Catholicism. And I think they, think they came up with that in the last 10 years. Political correctness. All it is, is the world religion is you can have your Jehovah and you can have your Buddha and you can have your Vishnu and your Ishwari and your Suti and you can have your gods over here and you can have yours and we'll all hold hands and we'll all get along. We'll go to heaven. We're all going to be go to heaven together different ways. That's the world religion. It's already in place. Huh? In God's we trust. Thank you, Willie. Yeah, in God's we trust. Plural. That's exactly it, in, in God's. Now, we're talking about the beast and the ten horns. The beast, I'm going to try to cover this 
pretty quick because I need to get back to the subject. I like that about Dracula, don't y'all? It means dragon. That's what it means. Now, if the if I started to say Dracula means dragon, Dracula would fascinate. Bella Lugosi would say, "Come to me." Fascinate. And they would go. Well, that's what the dragon actually means, a serpent. And the people in the first century, they believed that some weaving cobra was fascinating its prey. Any prey that knows there's a large snake there, the little field mice or, or some little animal, little rodent, they know to stop dead still, hoping that he won't sense them. They don't know that he's got heat sensors. And they believe that the animal is being fascinated like Dracula, the fascinator, the one that hypnotized the people and got them to stop. The same thing that Dracula the dragon did, that's the same thing that a serpent is supposed to be doing to its prey, according to the people in the first century. Fascinate meant to make somebody feel good. The doctrine of the devil makes people feel good. God's doctrine makes you feel bad in the flesh. It makes you feel guilty. It makes you feel like you're just a slug. The truth, everybody's got this thing turned around, don't they? They've got it twisted. When you go to the fifth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah said the time will come when men will call good evil and evil good. They're saying, I mean, those ignorant charismatics, Richard Roberts will get on the TV and say, when somebody's sick, he'll turn and he'll say, He'll say, Satan, get your hands off of God's property. Have you ever heard him say that? Yeah. He's calling God Satan. It's God that chastises people, not Satan. Satan makes you feel good. So his Satan is my God. My Satan is his God. They've got it. They've got evil good, good evil, sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet. And the world is twisted in their heads. The Bible doesn't teach what they say. The Bible teaches we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. In the world you shall have tribulation. All that will of God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Jesus said if the world hated me, you have to be hated. If you're popular in the world, you're an enemy of God. That's what the Bible says. You can quote verses real quick like that and just get people's brains scrambled because nobody uses those verses and they don't even know what they mean. So they've all got everything twisted. Now we're talking about the ten horns. Let's go back over here to chapter... Well, I didn't finish reading 13. I stood on the sand of the sea and saw the beast, Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, rise up out of the Mediterranean Sea. How if I read it like that? Having seven heads and ten horns, and upon its head, horns, ten crowns, and upon its heads, the name of blasphemy... And the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard, Greece, and its feet as the feet of a bear, Persia, and its mouth as the mouth of a lion, Babylon, and the dragon, the Dracula, the fascinator, the feel-good teacher, gave it its power, its seat, and great authority. Now, I'm not going to go back into what we talked about last week, taking me too much time. Now, a head was a capital city. I saw one of its heads, one of its capital cities as it were wounded to death. That's what a head was back in that day and time. And its deadly wound was healed. That was the outlawing of the Roman Empire where it was reinstituted in the form of Roman Catholicism and they merely changed the names of the gods. Jupiter was turned to Peter and, uh, and Aphrodite was called, began to be called Mary uh, of Roman Catholicism and so on. Now let's go back over to don't have time to go through that. Let's go to Revelation 17. Verse 12. We're talking about the beast that the harlot sits upon. The harlot is the Babylonian religious system. You ought to remember. You got, the, you got Babylon. Hold on. You got on the Euphrates River... Here's the Persian Gulf down here. And this is Iraq here. Of what was called in the ancient world Babylon. Babylon. Now you had the Babylonian Empire. 
That was the empire. That was the beast. Then you had, on the Euphrates River, right up here about where Baghdad is, you had Nineveh. And that was uh, the capital, that was the capital city of the, of the Assyrian Empire. That's why when you find Assyria and Babylon mentioned in the Bible, they are equated as the same system because they occupied the same land area. They had a lot of the same gods. Well, Babylon was also a city, but the city was a head. Now, just like Nashville. Nashville, we got Tennessee here. And Nashville is sitting right here. And Nashville rules to the borders of Tennessee, doesn't it? The laws of Nashville reach out throughout all of Tennessee. Nashville would be considered the head or the mother. Mother. Metropolis. What is a metropolis? Mother of the people. That's what metropolis means. It means a mother. When we have a metropolitan area, we have a mother of the people. Cities were called mothers. Capital cities were called mothers. And the little cities throughout the area were called daughters. So whenever you see the daughters of Israel, it's usually talking about the city, the, the cities around. These other, uh, you go out here to Jackson, that would be considered a daughter of Nashville. That's what they called it. So, so you have the Babylonian system, which is the beast, and then you've got the city that rules it all. That's the religion of it. And that was founded. That's exactly the same spot that Babel was built. It was founded on let us make us a name. That's the religion. Let us make us a name. Genesis 11 and 4. So you've got the Babylonian, the Babylonian empire and the Babylonian city. And when you see the harlot... Riding upon the beast, the beast is Babylon, the harlot is, look at chapter 17, the last verse. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city that reigns over the kings of the earth. But if it finally evolved into Roman Catholicism, when Babylon fell to Persia, Persia fell to Greece, then Greece dissolved into to four generals of Alexander the Great, one of them killed him, uh, Lysacomus. I think it's last. Yeah, that's it. Lysacomus, Cassander, Seleucus. It was probably the one that killed him. I wouldn't doubt if it wasn't Seleucus. He was the most greedy, and he had got the lion's share of the kingdom, and then Ptolemy. And Ptolemy got Egypt, probably was Seleucus. If there's anybody, I just suspect I think it would be Seleucus. And then Babylon, then Rome takes over this system, and then Rome is outlawed because two of the Caesars will not wear the robes of the Pontifex Maximus, that is the robes of the fire high priest of Rome, so they outlaw it and reinstitute it in the form of Roman Catholicism, and then... Uh, Mr. Constantine issues an edict of toleration and said, we'll all get along, we won't kill Christians anymore. And they let everything come into the church and he blended paganism. He took all the pagan gods, the tree gods, the sun gods, and called that Christ Mass or Christmas. And brought, it, brought into the church that feast of Saturn. And then it became Roman Catholicism and that's where this whole thing evolved to. So it's evolved into that. That's where we come up. And all that Roman Catholicism is, is an enchanting 
goodness, you go to one of their churches and it's like, I mean, it sounds like you're going, does it nearly put you to sleep, Gerald? Is it kind of fascinating you're going, boy, it sure does look religious, doesn't it? It's boring. You can do what you want to, can't you? Gerald, can you be anything you want to be and be a Catholic? You can get drunk. Gerald said he used to go drink with the priest and get drunk with the priest. <laughs> All the, yeah. Something else, aren't you? you? See, when you have that kind of a religion and you can be forgiven for what you do on Saturday night, Friday night and Saturday night, you can go to Mass on Sunday morning. You're free to do what you want, aren't you? You can go after all that's in the world, huh? He's the one that yeah, yeah, the guy that was drunk with you. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? Is that, a free, is that a freedom to do what you want to do? Can you go after the tree? You can go after anything you want to go after. And we've got a lot of people that were Catholics here. Huh? Yeah. It's like God doesn't really mean you have to crucify the flesh. After all, you had a hard week. Let's go drink some tonight and go party and go dancing, okay? Well, let's go get the priest and we'll feel good about it. It's amazing they put that in the movies, don't they? You remember the Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta? The priest goes to the bar with him, the club, and he's out there. Hey, boy, you're really going to be a great dancer. And he's just congratulating everybody, and they're drinking, and they're all smoking. And they say, yeah, and it's like they're all cussing and carrying on, and the priest is there with them going. They even put it in their movies. Don't they? You lived it, yeah. Gerald was a good drunken Catholic. What a good Catholic. Well, you're probably about as good as they were. Well, we were talking about when, you, when you're fascinated, you get to have what you want. They don't forbid anything to you. You can do what you want to do and have what you want to have. Just as long as you get forgiven for, for sin and pay them some money for mass and pay them some money to get some people out of purgatory. Right? You couldn't eat the bread unless you went to confession on Saturday. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was wonderful because it let everybody off the hook. Everybody had to do what they want to do. And that's, and that's, but you know what? The whole world is Roman Catholic because everybody says, well, look, that's his business. It's not your business to call him down. It's not your business to correct him. Look, everybody's got a right to be who they want to be and, and have whatever kind of religion. And we've all got a right to just be ourselves. And that's Catholicism, folks, isn't it? Huh? They and they call themselves good. Yeah. I'm a good person. Yeah. I know I got drunk last night and beat my wife, but basically I'm a good person. Yeah. Huh? Isn't that, isn't that what they say? <laughs> what that does, that gives you freedom to do. That freedom gives you, that fa that's fascinating to people, isn't it? Yeah. Boy, you talk about making people feel good. They can do what they want and have God too. Mm -hmm. Is the world that way? We have become Roman Catholic. The Baptists are Roman Catholic and they don't even know it. The Charismatics are Roman Catholic and they don't even know it. Because Roman Catholic is not counting your beads and praying. It's just saying, hey, you have a right. You have your rights. Let's all be politically correct. Let's issue an edict of toleration. Huh? That's all it's about, isn't it? It's I'll drink to that. <laughs> You're funny, Gerald. <laughs> You'll drink Coke to that. <laughs> don't, Gerald don't even drink coffee anymore. Gerald is, a, Gerald is a great testimony because he, he heard us on, he just said he was going to clubs and gambling and, and drinking and carousing and taking drugs and up into his late 50s. And then he just said, I, all of a sudden, I began to say, I've got to find the truth. I've got to find the truth. 
And he started hunting and searching. And the guy shared a tape, one of our tapes with him. And he started listening to us on the radio. And he said, that's it. And he called and he said, man, what am I going to do? I said, you can move up here. And he said, okay. I, and he did. He's been here about four years. He's got a great, great testimony about his past. He'll tell you what a heathen he was and how God has just turned his world upside down. We got a lot of people that were heathens, including me. You know, and God's turned our worlds around. Now, let's get back here to Revelation 17. Something had to give this beast power to do what it did. The only purpose for the beast, the only purpose... The beast had one reason for existing. It was to scourge Israel. That's all. Israel was supposed to be able to whip all nations when they were obedient to God. Anyone who came against them, they could destroy them. God said so. If you were obedient to God and you were in Israel, you could whip all the world. Now, that, well, let's look at that before I read this in Revelation 17. Look at it one more time. De Deuteronomy 28. I won't read it all. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 1. If it shall come to pass, Israel, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee, and overtake thee. And thou shalt, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Now you're going to be blessed, number, verse 3, in the city, in your field, the fruit of your body, verse 4, the fruit of your cattle, the fruit of your kind, your flocks of sheep, verse 5, your basket and store will be blessed, verse 6, when you go out and you come in, you're going to be blessed. In verse 7, The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. And it doesn't matter how many there are and how few you have. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. If it's ten million people, if it's Babylon the beast, they won't have a chance against you. If they've got ten million and you've got ten... Because you've got me on your side and I've got all kinds of earthquakes in my arsenal, all kinds of storms, and I've got volcanoes. I've got ammunition they don't have. I've got stars in, in the sky. I've got asteroids I'll drop on their heads. They can't out fight me, Israel. But he says in verse 15, It shall come to pass if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments, and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and shall overtake thee. You be cursed in the city, in the field, your basket, and your store, your body, your fruit of the land, the kind, your cattle, the flocks of sheep. When you go out and you come in, cursing, vexation, rebuke, all you set your hand to do, you're going to perish quickly for the wickedness of thy doings. And pestilence will cleave unto you, and the Lord will cause it. Until he's consumed you off the land. The Lord will smite you. The Lord will smite you. The Lord will smite you. The Lord will smite you with consumption. Not the devil. When God's people go under attack. And they're not winning. It's from God. The Lord will smite you with consumption. With fever and with inflammation. With extreme burning. With the sword. With blasting. With mildew. I'll send hard winds to dry everything up, and then I'll send heavy rains and make it so wet that you'll be miserable. And they shall pursue thee until thou perish, and your heavens over your head will be brass. There'll be no rain. The earth under your feet will be iron. There'll be no crops. And God will do this to his people. And the charismatics say God won't do this. God will destroy his people. And God will make you rain. The rain on your land will be powder and dust. Verse 24. Verse 25. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. You'll go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. And you'll be removed. When it says you'll be removed to all the kingdoms of the earth. Removed is a reference to the beast. 
God said, I'll send the sword, the famine, the pestilence over and 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 over. And finally, I'll get fed up with you after 500 years when Israel was a nation from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. God says, I've had my fill. I'll send the beast to carry you away into captivity. And we're talking about that. When? When he says, I will remove you to all the kingdoms of the earth. He's saying, you won't win anymore. If you're obedient to me, you'll always win. Verse 7 says, you can go against your enemy one way, and it matters not how many there are. You will win if you're obedient to me. When you're disobedient, it don't matter how many there are of you. I'll destroy you with your enemies. What Israel did when they disobeyed God for 500 years and went after Baal in the grove, the same system that was brought into the church by Constantine, fire and tree worship, that is the Christmas tree, whether anybody likes it or not. When that was brought into the church, that's the same system that Israel went after and that is the way Israel gave up their existence as a nation That is the way they gave up their power to the beast. They gave their existence as a nation and they gave their ability to whip the world to the beast when they disobeyed God, didn't they? Didn't they do that? Isn't that simple? That's what they did. And then let's go back to Revelation 17. I keep saying this. A horn was a power. Northern Israel was ten tribes, and each one of them was considered an army or a horn. A horn meant a power. A horn meant strength. Each one of those tribes in northern Israel, ten tribes to make up northern Israel, and it was, it was a man named Ahab and his wife Jezebel that brought this Baal worship into Israel. When Ahab married Jezebel... Her father was Eth Baal, a priest of the Ashtaroth, a priest of Baal. They brought it into Israel. And Micah says, what is the transgression of Israel? Is it not Samaria, northern Israel? Wasn't it the ten northern tribes? Wasn't it the ten horns that brought this system into Israel? And then Jezebel and Ahab's daughter, Athaliah, married into southern Judah and took it down to southern Judah. But God said, I'll scatter you. And he scattered northern Israel. Let's read one more time. One more time here in Revelation 17. And let me read it the way I would read it. And the t Verse 12. And the ten northern tribes of Israel. Thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. God's going to make Israel repent. But it's going to be spiritual Israel, the church. And hadn't received a kingdom as yet. But it doesn't mean at the time that John wrote this that they didn't have a kingdom. Because the Bible says here in verse 17. For God hath put it in their hearts. The hearts of the ten horns or the ten tribes. Hath put is past tense. It's aorist indicative. And anytime you see aorist indicative. That means past tense. John wrote this in 96 A.D. Sometime before 96 A.D., the ten horns gave the beast power and gave them their kingdom. And he says it, For God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom somewhere in the past to the beast. There's only one kingdom that gave their kingdom to the beast. It was as though Israel handed it to them on a platter. They said, here's our kingdom. We're serving out of God's. God said, we couldn't whip you if we serve out of God's. Here's our existence. Carry us away into captivity. And when they were carried away, Jerusalem was burnt to the ground. The temple was disassembled and there wasn't a stone left upon another and it was destroyed in Jeremiah's lamenting in Babylon. Jeremiah writes the lamentations for the people that are in Babylon to lament over no city, no God, no worship. They gave up their existence. 
And that's what verse 12 says. The, uh, the beast has to get their power from somewhere, don't they? Do you think that God just gave the beast the power out of the clear blue sky to whip Israel? No. It was because of their disobedience. They gave their power away. They gave their kingdom away. God's, and isn't it amazing? Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, is right before they go in to possess the land. Here they are, wandering in the wilderness. Here's, it, here's the Mediterranean. Here's Israel. Here's Egypt over here. Here's Egypt. They come over here into the Sinai Peninsula, come down wherever the, the mountain is, uh, the Mount Sinai. They go up here to Kadesh Barnea. God tells them to go in and to conquer the land of the Anakims, the same land that we call the Gaza Strip or the land of the Philistines. And they say, there's giants in the land. We can't conquer it. And they were up there 40 days. So God says, you have to wander in the wilderness for 40 years to, to kill off all the people who didn't believe. And they come up just north of the Dead Sea. They're going to cross back into the land and right before they cross in, the book of Deuteronomy is written. And they're a pure people. And Deuteronomy is before. That's before they go in the land and even establish themselves. He says, when you don't follow me, he's warning them what he's going to do. And he's telling them that in the book of Deuteronomy. And he said, you're going to lose your kingdom when you go after idol gods. And there's places in Deuteronomy he says, when you go, not if you go, when you do this, I'm going to destroy you. So they actually handed the beast their kingdom on a platter, said, here's our kingdom. We'd rather serve idol gods and give you the kingdom and give you our existence. The only reason the beast could whip Israel was because they disobeyed God. Who could whip Israel? No one. Let's read it. These have one mind, verse 13, and shall give their power, their dunamis, their resurrection, their life to the beast. They became a dead nation in Babylon, didn't they? They were dead in Babylon. And shall give their power and strength, their exousia, their existence. They gave their existence away. There is nowhere in the Bible you can find that the beast, Babylon, got their strength anywhere other than Israel's apostasy. And Israel followed the dragon, the fascinating one, didn't they? Revelation 13 and 2 says the dragon gave, gave the beast its power, gave the beast its existence. Well, the dragon seduced Israel the fascinator, Satan, seduced Israel to go after Baal in the grove, the Christmas system, the Christ mass system, and they gave away their kingdom. But we've been studying. Let's go back. Let's go back to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. And I want us to see, was Israel able to conquer 2 Kings? How much time do I have, Mike? Uh, 32. Okay, let me, let me review something here. I've got so much, I need to review some. Let me just show you this. I may take a couple of weeks to go through this, and I may go through it quick and then come back and review it so I, I want you to see this Israel was a nation for five about 510 years under kings from first Samuel Samuel to second chronicles this is everything the Bible is about I've had people say you put that on the board all the time that's everything the Bible is about this is Israel it's Israel the Bible is about nothing but the salvation of God's people. We are spiritual Israel of the church. If you don't study this, you don't know nothing about Israel. They went after Baal in the grove. 
Baal was Hercules, the grove was Venus, they had many generic names, one of the generic names was Mithra in Rome, his birthday was December the 25th. A pope named Julius gave Christ Mass its pagan name and set up the birthday of Mithra, that's December the 25th, and switched that over to Jesus. They've really, really polluted everything. Well, Israel, of course, Israel split into two nations under Solomon when Solomon allows his wives to go after 700 wives and 300 concubines, to go after their Shemash and Molech and Ashtaroth, tree and sun deities. So God splits the kingdom to northern Israel, southern Judah. Northern Israel, the ten northern tribes of the ten northern horns brought it in. Southern Judah was Judah and Benjamin. Northern Israel was headed up by the tribe of Ephraim, the second-born son of Joseph, the eleventh son of Jacob. Now, northern Israel, you see, northern Israel ceases right here. Southern Judah doesn't cease till down here in 586 B.C. Northern Israel ceases in 722. See that right there? That's because Hoshea was the last king of northern Israel. God got fed up with northern Israel and said, I've had my fill of you. So Assyria comes in in 722 B.C., carries northern Israel away into captivity. That is... When we're studying 2 Kings 17, 18, and 19, we're talking about the events right here when they're carried away captive. Now, at this point, when Hoshea is king of northern Israel, Hezekiah is king of southern Judah. You can't have two more opposites in all the Bible. Hoshea was a wicked king. Hezekiah was one of the most righteous of God's kings. So southern Judah hasn't become completely polluted with this idolatry. It doesn't really fully come in till Hezekiah's son, Manasseh. Don't even understand that. Because the, each one of these kings had a prophet. They don't have all the prophets up here. But each one of these kings had a prophet. Out beside Hezekiah... They should have written Isaiah there. You got Isaiah up here. They're saying Isaiah starts here and Isaiah stays here all the way down through here. But Hezekiah's main prophet and dear friend, the priest of the king and the prophet. Hezekiah's prophet was Isaiah. So when, when the, you had three deportations of southern Judah in southern Judah and you had... Three deportations of northern Israel. In the 17th chapter of 2 Kings, the Assyrian monarch comes down to set up northern Israel as a vassal kingdom. Assyria is the power of the world at this point. Now, and when Assyria comes down... They set up a vassal kingdom, and they've got a man named Shalmaneser. This was one of the Assyrian, this was the Assyrian king. Now, after Shalmaneser dies, the next king of Assyria comes down. He comes in and carries northern Israel away into captivity. His name is Sennacherib. Sennacherib. Now, Sennacherib comes in, and Sennacherib is a very presumptuous man. He thinks, because he can carry northern Israel away, who believes in Jehovah God, while he's there, he'll just go down and pick up southern Judah while he just happens to be down there. Well, we, we destroyed northern Israel... And they couldn't get away from us. And we've destroyed all the lands around the world. How can southern Judah get away from us? They're even smaller. And they don't even have any mighty armies. But if you've got righteousness in southern Judah, Hezekiah and Isaiah, and you try to attack these two men, that's like trying to attack Superman, you know.
Superman, Captain Marvel, and, and uh, Wonder, Wonder Woman, yeah. All of them at once. That's like, that's like trying to attack this huge power because you've got the righteousness of God in Hezekiah and Isaiah. So while, when we're in the 18th chapter, the threat comes upon southern Judah by the Sennacherib that's there that he's going to come down and destroy them. And when you get to the 19th chapter, you see what God meant when he said, your enemy will come against you one way and they'll flee seven ways. The 19th chapter shows us that when southern Judah is living righteously, you don't have a chance against Hezekiah, Isaiah, and God. Because that's what they're attacking. God, the living God, Hezekiah and Isaiah. And there's only a few people in southern Judah. And the armies of the Assyrians encamp outside of Jerusalem Hundreds of thousands of them. The people are scared. It's kind of frightening. Let's go back over here. And I just want to show you, even an empire couldn't whip southern Judah. It was impossible. Now let's go back over here to 17th chapter. 17th chapter. That's its kingdom that's set up under a big king just to be, to have puppet kings over there. They're just representatives. That's like, uh, here's Babylon, and, and he sets up his own kings over there. He comes in there and says, you'll set this man up over here, and he finds somebody that's kind of a pansy in Israel that people will listen to. And you say, sit, you sit on the throne and you do what I tell you. And they say, yes, sir. They call them. Assyria was the first people to use this term. Since if you were, you were the ruler of Nineveh, that is the capital city of Assyria, and here's the Assyrian Empire, and you are the king of Nineveh, you couldn't, you, over here in Israel, you couldn't take care of Israel, and over here in Greece, and over here in, in uh Ethiopia and Egypt, you couldn't have your men over there. So what you did, you set up, you would send emissaries in there and you'd find some compromising person and you'd say, you want to be king on my throne? Yes, sir, I'll do whatever you say. And you do what I tell you to do, you're your people. And you say, I I'll do it. And you execute who I say? Yes, sir. I'm a pansy. I got no guts. I'd rather live. Uh, and compromise my laws with my God than to die. I love you, just a sissy guy, you know. They, that's what they look for. And that's what they set up as their kings. So whenever they ruled all the world, they would allow you to rule yourself until you got out of hand. If you got out of hand, they'd send an army in on you. And then they'd slaughter you and butcher you. And what they called this, you were a king over here, but they called the king of Assyria, king of kings. That's because he was the king over these kings. Jesus said, no, that's me. Jesus is the king of kings. So that began back here with Assyria. So, they, so what they did is they went to Israel and set up kings. Now let's get back here. I want to review just a little bit of this. Uh, I've got so much here to go to. I'll just read some to you. How much time, Mike? I want to know how far I can go. Okay. I'm just going to read to you a little bit of rundown. In chapter 17, we see that in the 12th year of Ahaz, king of Judah began Hoshea the son of Elah, to reign in Samaria, that's northern Israel. Hoshea, he's the last king of northern Israel. He's going to be the king of northern Israel when the Assyrians come here and sweep them away. He's the last king. 
verse 7. Here's why they were carried away. For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, which had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. Verse 7. Also from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods. They went after other gods all the time they were a kingdom. Then verse 8. And Israel walked in the statutes of the heathen. That's why God carried them away. Whom the Lord cast out from before the children of Israel. Then he goes on to say, uh, verse 9, The children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchmen to the fence cities. The high places were the hills outside the city where that they kept their tree goddesses, their Ashtaroth, their groves. And then down in verse 13, Yet the Lord testified against Israel, against Judah, by all the prophets. The prophets came and said, if you don't repent, God's going to destroy you with the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and then the beast will carry you away, and you'll give your kingdom away to them. And by all the seers saying, turn ye from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes. Verse 14, notwithstanding they would not hear, but hardened their necks. Israel said, we won't hear. Verse 15, they rejected his statutes and his covenants. I don't have time to read all of it. Just going to give you a little overview. And verse 8, uh, not verse 8, but verse 16, very important. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images and two calves and made a grove, a tree goddess, and worshipped all the host of heaven, and served Baal the sun god, or Hercules was his proper name, in Tyre and Sinai. This Israel worshipped Hercules and Venus. People don't even know that. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire, and use divination and enchantments. And then in verse, seven, in verse uh, 18, Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel, and removed them. That's a reference to the beast. That's a reference to them giving up their kingdom. Removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. None left but Judah. There's the surviving kingdom. Northern is carried away. That's the reference. And only Judah was left. Well, the king, Shalmaneser, you see Shalmaneser in verse 3. Against Hoshea came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria. That was the one that comes here. Now, let me show you something in verse... In verse 24, is very important to understand. The king of Assyria brought men from Babylon and from Kutha, which is a province in Assyria, and these were idol worshippers, and from Ava, which was a region of Assyria, and from Hamath, which is in Syria, and from Sepharvarim, this is also a place in Assyria, and placed them in the cities of northern Israel or Samaria to live there instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. You know how important that verse is? That's why the Pharisees hated the Samaritans. Because they had a mixed religion and the Syrians came there and settled in Samaria and they mixed their religion with the Samaritans. And when the Pharisees, when the Pharisees were going to go from Israel to northern, when they was going to go anywhere north of Israel, they would cross the Jordan River and go around. They said Samaria was the most filthy place in the earth to live. Because they had a mixed religion there. And they would spit on these people, call them pigs and swine. Remember when Jesus in John, the fourth chapter, went up to the well of Samaria and he met the Samaritan woman? And he said, I'll give you living water and you'll never have to draw again out of Jacob's well. And she said, what are you doing talking to me? You are a rabbi from Israel. I can tell by your robe. Why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman. You don't even talk to Samaritans. 
And he, he said, he said, the time will come when you worship God in spirit and truth. But right now, you worship you know not what. That's the way he put it to her. Why did he say that? They had a mixture. This is the whole confrontation. This verse right here is the whole reason for the confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Because Jesus came to the Samaritans. He came to the Gentiles. He came to the sinner. To the downtrodden. And the Pharisees had their halakha and their haggadah, didn't they? They said that northern Israel, because of these pagans that had settled there and had mixed their religions, they said because northern Israel did this, that made them more filthy than them. But they twisted the word of God with their halakha and made it more acceptable. They were worse than the Samaritans, wasn't they? I mean, you need to put a big circle around that right there. That's the whole purpose of the confrontation between Jesus and the Samaritans. And that's why they hated the Samaritans so bad. Right here. What? Oh, oh, the Pharisees hated the Samaritans. Yeah, excuse me. All right. Now. All right. I mean, I've got so much to... I don't want to review this whole thing. I'll come back and review some of this. Let's go to chapter 18. Hezekiah. The son of Ahaz is king of southern Judah. There in verse 1, he removes all the high places in Judah. Verse 4, he cuts down the groves, breaking pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. They were worshiping that. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nahushtan, or something made of copper, what's the word means. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after Hezekiah was none like unto him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. Now the king of Syria, Shalmaneser, look at verse 9. It came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hoshea, son of Eli, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. That means they put their armies all around Samaria. To besiege meant to put them under total subjection to them that they couldn't move. It's like being in a city and an army just surrounds you and says, okay now, we dictate to you. And at the end of three years, they took it. Samaria was taken. That's northern Israel, verse 10. And the king of Assyria did carry northern Israel into Assyria. That's right here. He carries them off into Assyria. We've talked about this so many times. This is in 722 B.C. Approximately. Some say up to 726, 722. But 722 is the most commonly accepted. And the reason is, verse 12, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. But in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fenced cities of Judah and took them. All the cities, the daughters of Israel. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, saying, I have offended. That's because, in verse 7... Hezekiah refuses to serve Assyria. But Hezekiah is getting real nervous. Hezekiah was a human like us. If you look at verse 7, he rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. So Hezekiah starts making some compromises. Hezekiah, king of, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria saying, I've offended you. Return from me that which thou puttest on me. Will I bear whatever kind of tax, whatever kind of levies you put on us. I know you're the king of the world. You're the king of kings. The king of Assyria pointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Here's your tax. The king of Assyria is the boss. He thinks. And Hezekiah gave him silver that was in the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. 
At that time, did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord? And Hezekiah really begins to compromise. But he's only a human. He's frightened. There's this mighty army coming up against him. And he's, he thinks he has really stirred the ire of Sennacherib. And the king of Assyria, verse 17, sent Tartan and Rabsaris and Rabshakeh from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. They have literally conquered the whole world and now their entire army is up against Jerusalem. But we've got Hezekiah and Isaiah in Jerusalem. Just a few people, but we've got the two most righteous men in the world there. And God says, if the king is righteous, you can't beat Israel. Forget it. And the Rabshakeh comes up to the wall of Jerusalem. And he says, the Rabshakeh said unto them, he speaks unto Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, the high priest, in uh, verse 18, the Rabshakeh means the representative of the king who's out there in his army. Rabshakeh said in verse 19, Speaking now to Hezekiah, Thus saith the great king of Assyria, Sennacherib. What is this confidence wherein you trust your God? Thou sayest, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for war. Now on whom are you going to trust? That thou rebellest against me. I'm the great king of Assyria. How are you gonna how are you gonna come up against me? Well, you got Hezekiah and Isaiah, that's all you need. Two nuclear warheads. Same thing. <laughs> yeah. Now behold thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed upon Egypt. You've been trying to run over there for solace and for protection. We are Assyria. The Egyptians don't have a chance against us. On which if a man lean, if you lean up on Egypt, it'll be like a bruised reed go right through your hand. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he? Now look at this. Here's what the Rabshakeh says to Eliakim, the, the son of Hilkiah, the high priest. He says, but, I, but if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah had taken away? Rabshakeh doesn't know the difference between sun worship and Jehovah worship. He thinks that Rabshakeh, when he removes the high places, when Hezekiah removes them over in verse 4, Rabshak is such a stupid man, he thinks those are the altars of Jehovah God. And Hezekiah removing them because they're the altars of pagan gods. This guy's an idiot. Isn't he? Everything in the Bible is true, but everything some stupid man says in the Bible isn't true. This guy's a moron. <laughs> he thinks the high places that Hezekiah removed was Jehovah God's high places. Jehovah God's not the grove and Baal. That's what, that's what Hezekiah destroyed. Whose altars Hezekiah taken away and has said to Judah and Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria. And I'll give you plenty of money and riders. And then he says in verse 25, Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? Now notice what the Reb Shaka says that the king of Assyria says. The Lord said to me, go up against this land Israel and destroy it. Whew, that's exactly what God said. I don't know if the king of Assyria actually knew that or if he was just saying that and God put those words in his mouth. If he's saying, the Lord told me to come and destroy you and that was his imagination, but it's actually what God wanted. Because God said he'd send the beast to destroy him. Verse 28. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language. Wait a minute. Let me read this to you. Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, in verse 26, he got a little upset because 
They were speaking in the Hebrew language. So Eliakim, he doesn't want to upset the people of Israel because here's this guy standing by the wall of Jerusalem saying, the great king demands your surrender. So, so Eliakim says, could you speak in the Syrian language? We understand Syrian. Says that in verse 26. And when he says that, the Rabshakeh says, aha, so you're scared. Let me frighten your people. And in verse 28, then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language. They just got through asking him, please don't yell at the people. We're just a little group of people. We're a little small town. Couldn't you be a little quieter? Couldn't you talk in the Syrian language, in the Aramaic? We understand Aramaic. The people don't. You're upsetting them. So he stands up and gets real loud, obnoxious. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king of Assyria, Judah! He starts yelling at him. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Oh, Hezekiah can't, but God can. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will deliver us in this city, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. He said, Don't you let Hezekiah tell you that that's not true. This guy doesn't know nothing, does he? And he said, Until I come and take you away to the land, like your own land, in verse 32. And look at verse 33. Rabshak is still talking. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the king of Assyria? Has any of the lands of the world been able to deliver themselves by their gods? No one has stood before us and they've all prayed to their gods. What makes you think your God can deliver you, Judah? Ooh, what an arrogant man. Do I have any time, Mike? Mm. I got to this point last week, but I, but I wasn't, I hadn't covered this correctly. I read through it too fast last week. In verse 1, I'll read a few verses here. It came to pass when King Hezekiah heard all of this, he rent his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, his messenger, that had talked to Rabshakeh, which was over the household of Shebna the scribe and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth. He sent them to Isaiah. <laughs> That's a good man to go to, isn't it? <laughs> Saying, Isaiah, what are we going to do? the prophet of the son of Amos, and they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble for Judah, and of rebuke and blasphemy, for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God. And will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore lift up thy prayer, Isaiah, for the remnant that are left, for Judah were all that's left. And you're righteous, and we have a righteous king. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard. They don't mean a thing. He's just a noisy loudmouth. Don't care how many is in his army. With which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, 
and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Sennacherib will go back home and die there. But before he goes, I'm going to blast him, God says, right outside the city gate. You see, southern Judah was righteous at this, this point. And they thought, well, we've conquered northern Israel and all the other lands. The only reason you could conquer northern Israel is because they were disobedient to God and they were as heathen as anybody. But you can't conquer southern Judah when that's guy's king. Forget it. That's not going to happen. I'm out of time, ain't I? I've covered this a little better. We'll come back and cover 19 next week. There's some other things I want you to see about 17. 17, 18, and 19 is one of the major events of all the Bible concerning Israel. It was the first deportation and the first slaughtering in Israel and carrying away of Israel into captivity. That is, that's why 17, 18, and 19 of 2 Kings... Very important section of scripture to understand. You know what that you know what this begins? This begins the movement that takes us into southern Judah being carried away and moves us into the 70 weeks of Daniel. This is more or less the beginning of it all right here. It moves us right into that. Well, let's pray and I'll come back. And I promise you, I may kind of pepper through here. If I actually studied 17 and 18 and 19 of 2 Kings the way we should, we ought to take each verse and take about two or three months. Because this is the capstone of the captivity right here. We've, how many times have we talked about this? A thousand times in the past year? Every time we talk about Christmas, every time we talk about the 70 weeks, every time we talk about the tongues, the gloss, and the dialects, I start bringing this out. And I always say, Northern Israel was carried away in 722 B.C. And that's all I say. And here it is right here. We'll come back. And I'll, if y'all don't mind me doing this, I'll take some time through 17 and 18 and 19 and try to keep covering it. Because you can't cover this. These, these three chapters have to be covered together. And they have to be covered thoroughly. And it's so much there that I'll... I'm going to use these chapters as one picture. So you can kind of glean through it each week and see the picture of it. And the same is true when northern Israel is carried away captive. In the 36th chapter of Second Chronicles. I mean when southern Judah is carried captive in the 36th chapter of Second Chronicles. And all this does is show you... That the beast couldn't whip Israel in the 19th chapter. Assyria was a part of the Babylonian system. Assyria couldn't whip Israel. Babylon couldn't whip Israel. The beast was there for one reason. Israel gave their power over to the beast. The beast was there as a scourging rod. It was a whipping stick. It was a sword that God used to cut Israel down with. And when he got through with Assyrian Babylon, Persia, Greece, he breaks the, the sword of the switch and throws it away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth and for your word. Help us to get a grasp on what you do to us when we see this picture. When we're disobedient to you, Lord, you get a switch after us. You've got one after me for 30 years. And you beat me mercifully, Lord. Thank you for truth. Lord, when we are truly obedient to you, our enemies can't conquer us. And Lord, it don't happen the way we think it's going to happen. It happens over a long period of time. You show us that. Thank you for that. Continue to cause us to walk in your truth that we may conquer, that you conquer our enemies, Father. Crush us under your hand. Lead us to your elect and we'll give you praise in Christ's name. Amen.